Yeah. Um, I mention there's, there's some chairs over this way. If people want to, if people are too far away and they want to move around, there's more space over here. Just, just want to shuffle around. Um, but next up, um, we have Jeremy Johnson, who has um, you know, been I've been working closely with over the last couple of years in the Deaf Society. And, um, he, he, um, he was helping me out with this conference, but he also was instrumental in putting together the last year's conference in New York. Um, this year he's talking on metamatrices, planetary lattices, and integral A wearing, which is a comparative look at William Owen Thompson and Ken, and Ken Wilber and my dear John Getzer. So um, please welcome Jeremy Johnson. Yay. Okay, so I have a lot of slides for this, hopefully I can get through. Um, this is kind of a big topic for me because I recently went to the Integral Theory Conference and blocked that. Jordan Optic is here. Uh, so I was kind of interested, uh, based on this topic of uh, architects of the integral world, to just sort of let these different integral theories speak to each other. But another element of that was that I felt that Gebser's work hasn't really been as appreciated in its own light as a kind of instrument to really engage with contemporary issues and look at culture and society and like really wrestle with it in a way that maybe more contemporary thinkers like Wilbur uh, have been seen to be more you know, um, modern, I guess, or more contextual. Uh, but so, too, William Irwin Thompson, uh, who, in my mind anyway, is one of the most interesting integral thinkers, and uh, I just don't hear him brought up that much, just, you know, he's quoted here and there. So anyway, um, I wanted to start with Wilbur and allow Wilbur to kind of speak and then be spoken to through Gebser and then kind of move into uh, uh, William Irwin Thompson. So in, uh, in Wilbur's own words, to be fair, because I'm going to be a little critical, uh, <laughs> but to start on a good note, Wilbur writes, uh, all my books are lies, they are simply maps of a territory Shadows of a reality, gray symbols dragging their bellies across the dead page, suffocated signs full of muffled sound and faded glory, signifying absolutely nothing. And it is the nothing, the mystery, the emptiness alone, that needs to be realized. Not to know, not know, but felt. Not thought, but breathed. Not an object, but an atmosphere. Not a lesson, but a life. So, Wilbur is clearly acknowledging that the kind of maps, if you're familiar with Ken Wilbur, there's maps and matrices and well, I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, so, yeah, he also says that my work is an attempt to make room for the cosmos for all dimensions, levels, domains, waves, memes, modes, individuals, cultures, and so on, ad infinitum. I have one major rule. Everybody is right, but more specifically, everybody, including me, has some important pieces of truth, and all of those pieces need to be honored, cherished, and included in a more gracious, spacious, and compassionate embrace. So, hence... Stuff like this. <laughs> There's a lot to be included. Um, and it's very interesting, and actually, if you go into each aspect of the theory, it, it can be very helpful and useful to organizing knowledge. Um, and today, especially today in the internet age, where we're kind of having information overload, Wilbur sort of foreshadowed the need to kind of organize the flood of information that we're having, and as a lot of our artwork today, uh, definitely reflects that kind of experience. This is just sort of like every day on the internet, really, but... <laughs> um, so, to kind of go into this a little further, Wilbur writes that each thing is a perspective before it is anything else. Hence, lots of different things going on. Um, and this means that in the manifest world there are no perceptions, only perspectives. As far as we know or can know, the manifest world is made up of sentient beings with perspectives. Not things with properties, nor subjects, nor perceptions, nor vacuum potentials, nor dharmas, nor strings, nor holograms, nor buyer fields. Those are all perspectives relative to some sentient being. And of course, this is the sort of crux of Wilbur's work, the aqua, and I know I uh, mentioned that earlier this morning, but there's sort of the interior on the left-hand side and the exterior is a way to sort of map out and construct reality in a very kind of neat and organized way. Um, so, this is where, when you read Gebser, 
you start to feel a kind of cognitive disconnect, sort of difference, a divergence. And I read Wilbur first, and I discovered Gebser through Wilbur, actually. It cracked open ever-present origin. Uh, and my school's library was surprisingly had it at Fordham University. But maybe I shouldn't be surprised, because Fordham is a Jesuit university, and they had Teilhard books, too. But um, so this is a Feuerstein quote, just describing uh, the sort of problems with the mental rational consciousness and uh, sort of its limitations. But anyway, to bring about this necessary transformation, the projections of the rational consciousness as a deficient, hypertrophied manifestation of the mental consciousness must become fully conscious. It must be conclusively understood that far from constituting the pinnacle of human evolution or the ultimate flowering of progress, the attitude of rationalism is an evolutionary dead end. Ratio is like the peak of the mountain that is oblivious to the massif on which it rests. Towering above the clouds, the vast structures below remain invisible and practically inexistent for it. So, on the one hand, I really appreciated Wilbur's work because it helped me sort of understand reality. But on the other hand, I got the distinct sense of being on the peak of the mountain, looking down. Um, and I couldn't really sort of figure that out with that kind of, I don't want to toss it out, so how could I really understand? Because there's an orientation towards wholeness in Wilbur's work that I think is definitely there. But at the same time, it seems to be uh, diagnosed with the mental rational deficiency that we know so well today. So, okay, so this is also a quote from a pure science book, uh, Oswald Spengler saying, the narrative of Verstand, am I pronouncing that? Ver Verstand? Verstand. Verstand. Is critique, the nature of Vernunft is creativity. Vernunft creates that which matters, Verstand presupposes it. So again, it's this way to try to understand different forms of thinking, ones that kind of open up knowledge and sort of allow us to kind of be diaphanous or transparent to the spiritual and then forms of knowledge which may close off the spiritual and sort of solidify and ossify the mental rational. Uh, and I began to sort of see Wilbur's maps as a kind of technology, kind of inner technology. Um, and Gebser writes this about it. He says, all making, whether in the form of spell casting or the reason technical construction of a machine is an externalization of inner powers or conditions, every tool, every instrument and machine is only a practical application. That is also a perspectival directed use of inherent laws, laws of one's own body rediscovered externally. Um, so I started to think of this stuff as kind of internal machines, ways of thinking that organize the mind and allow the mind to kind of go on certain tracks. And predictably so, very very mental, rational kind of way of doing it, but in a way that's actually very explosive and meta and cool and fun and it can actually handle complexity in a way that maybe we wouldn't assume the mental, rational, the deficient mental to be able to do. But um, this is where a couple other things come into play here. Um, image here of the spacesuit in 2001, and then also the psychonaut idea of the spacesuit kind of allowing you to kind of probe those depths. So, so this idea kind of struck me that these kind of inner maps are almost like uh, conceptual spacesuits to allow us from our mental rational space to kind of just peer into those vast depths and to kind of look into the integral consciousness with the veil of the mental rational. And it changes. The, the mental rational and makes it get bigger and more complex and in some way inflated because the mental rational can't handle the integral. It's too complex. It's it's alive. Um, so this is also an interesting note that Gebser had. And I've mentioned this in a previous conference about um, the evolution of consciousness being uh, Janus faced. So uh, Gebser writes, all of its manifestations are Janus faced. On the one hand, they are still bound to the consciousness structure in force until now which, to the extent that it is deficient, is now threatening to collapse. Yet they are already indebted to the, to the new, yet only gradually emerging consciousness structure, which is in process of formation. So I really started to see Wilbur as a kind of uh, intermediary figure who, in some ways, is reifying the mental rational and having trouble kind of containing it because his maps get bigger and bigger and bigger every kind of iteration. Uh, but on the other hand, he's also expressing something. He's, he's moved 
like I said, towards wholeness. Um, but then, of course, there's limitations to this. And Gebser also, also writes, for the most part, the pathological condition of our present civilization stems from the date of the introduction of perspectivity. And if you remember, Wilbur kind of mentions perspectives, and he's all about perspectives, and as many as he can fit into the, the map, um, which executed the alignments of aspects to a predetermined point and thereby effected a distortion of reality. For the part is, to a certain degree, always a betrayal of the whole, for which, the, for which reason the sum of the parts only yields a fictitious but not efficacious whole. And to this, this to me kind of just struck me as like, this is why I couldn't really grok Wilbur in the end. I had to go back to Gebser's work and kind of sink into that. Just the artificiality, perhaps, the construction of it, wrestling with the mental rational, wrestling with the manifestation of the integral, but not really being able to express it. Maybe there's another articulation. Um, this is a quote from Octavia Butler. There's nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. So, other people, meta alternatives. So I decided to look at William Irwin Thompson because like Wilbur, Thompson is thinking in a really big picture, uh, but he's using a very different methodology and a very different approach that's not as systemic. And this is sort of Thompson talking about planetary culture and where we are today. <coughs> Now we are taking another quantum leap in human culture. Marx would call it socialism, Bolding would call it post-civilization, and McLuhan would call it the electronic return to the tribe. The old art of the novel falls behind, for now reality itself becomes the work of art. And so the cycle spins around as Vico, Marx, and McLuhan knew it would. In primitive communism, art was knowledge. Uh, in electronic socialism, it is knowledge itself that becomes the work of art. In a world in which men write thousands of books and one million scientific papers a year, a mythic bricolore is the man, woman, who plays with all that information and hears a music inside the noise. So Thompson's pro approach is immediately more imaginative and creative. Not, he was systemic, and uh, I would love to go into his work and do a presentation on him alone, but it's too much for today. Uh, but really he's talking about, I mentioned this before as well, this concept of florilegium, uh, which means to gather flowers. And it's this concept that knowledge, in order to really grasp the bigger picture, you need to have a more intuitive and imaginative approach, which is to see the associations and relationships with things, but not necessarily gather them in any kind of systemic way. And uh, Florilegium is the title of certain texts from the medieval times, uh, basically collections of different holy sayings and prayers and things from the Bible, um, sort of an assemblage. So. To kind of digress slightly, uh, a popular terminology today, or at least something that I find very interesting, a lot of people are talking about, is network knowledge and combinatorial creativity, which is this idea that knowledge itself um, isn't actually systemic. Anything we know is sort of gathered from all different theorists and all different um, thinkers and ideas. So this is Maria Popova talking about this in one of her talks. Uh, she's the creator of Brain Thinking, so if you haven't for that site, it's a lot of fun. Uh, now implicit to this idea of combinatorial creativity is the admission that nothing is truly original, at least not in the sense of being built from scratch, and that can be hard. There's a lot of resistance in the creative ego to that idea, but there is plenty of evidence for this ecosystem of influences and inspirations. I believe creativity is the original open source code. So, Kevin Kelly also says something similar here. Uh, he's the founder of Wired, and uh, he says, over the next century, scholars and fans, aided by the computational algorithms, will knit together the books of the world into a single networked literature. A reader will be able to generate a social graph of an idea or a timeline of a concept, or a networked map of influence for any notion in a library. We'll come to understand that no work, no idea stands alone, but that all good, true, and beautiful things are networks, ecosystems of intertwingled parts, related entities, and similar works. So, on the one hand, and these are not necessarily mutually incompatible, I think Wilbur's work is, in a sense, trying to do this, um, but I'm more interested in the approach that doesn't attempt to centralize it into a singular theory. Um, but rather see the spaces between the objects that we're looking at. So this is Gebser, um, 
in uh, another translation from uh, Feuerstein, but from Rauch in Spain, describing the transformation of language uh, in the early 20th century and the sort of changing of the grammar and the shifting of the focus. What is gaining importance now is the spiritual light reigning between objects, the tension and the relation between them. So again, it's about this relationship, this network form of knowledge. So this is uh, Thompson sort of extrapolating a little bit on this concept of uh, understanding art as knowledge. In the days of planetization, when the unconscious is flooding the culture, the new art is of necessity about the relationships in the scale, noise, information, music. In the old art, there was only one direction from noise to music, but in the new art, there is always a sliding scale of consciousness that moves back and forth through these values. And if you notice, Thompson's all about this movement. It's all about relationship. It's all about the qualitative intensities of, uh, of things. And, okay, so there's another thing. Uh, imaginative artists like Blake could understand the collective condition of society because imagination is the opening to what Jung called the collective unconscious. The time of the, un the, time of the unconscious is out of time, in the space, in, in the space time of the unconscious, the past and the future mysteriously interpenetrate. So I found this to be interesting because it sort of uh, coincides exactly with what Gebster describes as the eruption of time, the bursting forth from the mental rational uh, conceptualization of linear time to the sense that time is actually wound up in itself. The past and the future are bound in the present. Um, and so any kind of methodology in an attempt to express or articulate the transformation of consciousness, I feel, would probably need a kind of sensitivity to this sense of time. Um, so, for me and, and for Thompson, instead of using uh, a meta map specifically, he's thinking meta, but he's using the imagination to sort of look at different things, um, artwork, storytelling, music, theories, in a very similar way that Gebser did actually in ever-present origin. He didn't just look at poetry, he looked at the science, sciences, he looked at new novels, he looked at works of art across history. And so for me anyway, I, I started to appreciate going forward as a sort of integral scholar, we have to look at the artwork and let the artwork speak for itself and let it speak to us. So um, I wrote, the biggest container for the emergent consciousness is not in fact a mental rational construct at all, only when we poetize our knowledge can we accurately describe the integral, the itself, or the new consciousness, let alone ourselves. Poetizing knowledge invites a wearing. It is an invitation for our knowledge systems to snap open the container of the closed ego into the deeper, multidimensional depths of the imagination. These give us myths, yet myths are not relegated to a single structure of consciousness, but offer us the opportunity to attune to the emergent, constellated, constellated narratives of planetary culture. So, I found an interesting passage in Every Present Origin with Gebser speaking specifically about creativity because I was interested in understanding myth not as just the structure of consciousness, of you know, mythic polarities and that sort of thing, but really kind of getting into what is the unconscious, what is the imagination. It doesn't just seem to be a structure. So this is kind of interesting from Gebser. Uh, he writes, in creativity, origin is present. Creativity is not bound to space and time, and its truest effect can be found in mutation, the course of which is not continuous in time, but rather spontaneous, a causal and discontinuous. Creativity is a visibly emerging impulse of origin, which is, in turn, timeless, or more accurately, before or above time and timelessness. And creativity is something that happens to us, that fully affects or fulfills itself in us. Creativity appears to be an irrational process, although it is actually irrational. It cannot be grasped systemically, and can at best be perceived systematically. Um, so, out of this kind of confluence of looking at Gebser and Wilbur and Thompson, I started to just kind of create a, a navigational list of how, how to go forward as a scholar of integral studies with these kinds of thinkers. What, what can I learn from this? How can I not fall into the same trap of, of uh, systemically organizing everything into a single map? Um, and I think it's very clear that if, if you just follow and listen and, and look at the artwork, so pay attention to the art across unrelated mediums, languages, cultures, and subcultures, 
Uh, and rather than systemically forging them as a sort of praxis, you can allow them to speak for themselves, allow the patterns to emerge in what you're looking at. Um, another important aspect is to study the relationship between time and space in the artistic medium. And it doesn't have to be art either, it can be any of the books that are coming out in, in, our, in our publishing world or in the mainstream press or in the New York Times bestseller list. Look for the narratives, look for the myths that are emerging in these sorts of things. Let them speak to each other. Um, and uh, Thompson mentioned something interesting in uh, one of his older books. Here are several verses he wrote. And uh, I like this idea because, it, again, it's sort of reiterating this concept of to gather the information, kind of listen to the theme that emerges before you start to play it yourself. The overlay of the multiple narratives allows for the emergent mythologies to come forth, let myth speak. Um, so that's like basically it in a nutshell in the presentation, but I had a few images just as examples. I've shown some of them before here, but what do images like, you know, with digital art, there's an explosion of different forms of media today that if we paid attention to it, it might tell us something about how is the integral manifesting today? Ever Present Origin was written in 1949, 1950. So, uh, Gebser was looking at the art of the time, but what about the art of today? Um, and of course, time is an important element, so just giving a few examples. What kind of effect does this have on our consciousness? Seeing the, the past sort of alive in the present. Not exactly a ghost either, but a kind of presencing, seeing through time. Um, I think this one is near Grand Central. But uh, another example that I thought was interesting is the narratives in novels and science fiction. And I'm a big science fiction geek, so I kind of been looking at sort of the pop culture for that emergent myth and that emergent narrative. And it's interesting that uh, folks like William Gibson, for instance, his latest novel was actually about time, time travel. Um, but not in the way we think. It's actually it's kind of complex, but basically the future colonizes the past and they speak to each other through, uh, through basically um, Skype. Uh, but the future can influence the past through its computer system, so they becomes a game to the future. You can manipulate stock market trades and screw around and buy politicians. So basically, our world becomes colonized by some future world that sees us as, it's kind of scary and dystopian, but at the same time, it's just this interesting play of time as this past, the past speaks to the present or the future. And there's also apocalyptic themes, which are interesting too and relevant for another discussion. Um, but I think I should just leave it here uh, this is Gebser saying that every one of us today, in his or her own way, wherever we may be, is not only a witness, but an instrument of what is to be reality. Hence the necessity for us to create the means with which we create ourselves, uh, which we create ourselves, can jointly shape this new reality. So, I guess I'm suggesting that we should pay attention to, you know, what we're creatively doing, and the narratives that we are unconsciously telling. Um, it was very clear to me that, you know, what Wilbur is unconsciously showing is like, okay, we're in that middle space, we're not out of the mental rational yet. So to be aware of that, to concretize that, as Gebser says, is really important, but then also to, to uh, be artists and creative and creative ourselves and to be sensitive ourselves to art, I think could actually go a long way for bringing our scholarship forward and really engaging with the world and uh, feeling connected to, like, the pulse of what is emerging in consciousness today. Okay, that's it. Gebser uses, uh, I mean, Wilbur uses Gebser in a very linear way. I mean, immediately, that's uh, probably the first issue, is that, uh, you know, he uses his map as a kind of developmental spectrum that, you know, from magic to myth to mental. And it's interesting, I didn't mention this in the talk, but it's interesting that uh, I don't know if Wilbur distinguishes, I haven't seen him distinguish between the mental and the mental rational. And he talks a lot about the emergence of the, of the modern mental 
at being in the Renaissance and being with the rise of science, but Gebser has a completely different take on that, which is, no, that was the deficient, uh, deficient uh, stage of the mental structure. So it's an interesting difference there. Um, it almost seems almost like a blind spot in, in Wilbur's using of uh, Gebser's work. But yeah, uh, Gebser has a completely sense of, different sense of time and uh, was very skeptical about anything that we mentioned before, about evolution or development or progress or positivism. Um, so in order to really get that out of him, in order to really get a sense that we're going somewhere, there is something happening, you have to really uh, wrestle with the complexity of evolution and the nonlinearity of it. Um, you have to redefine what it means to develop, and Gebser really stands strongly for that. Um, I, I think, yeah. That's, that's a good point, because, I mean, Gebser saw like, one of his key ideas was that really structural consciousness comes different modality of the experience of time. And of course, mental rational consciousness is linear chronological time. Because of course, the mythic consciousness is more sort of size of time. And there's just two. You know, but to, to see a mission through linear time, or the Earth's or cycle time, are just two modalities of the time. You get to resolve them now to the a achromon, or liberation of freedom from these temporal lenses. Now, the story used to be that, and I don't know whether it's true or not, that Ken Wilber uh, discovered Gebser in a magazine article in the 70s. There was a magazine, I don't remember the title of it, or Main Currents. Main Currents. Main Currents. Main Currents, and wonderful yeah. articles. And it was said that this was an article by or about Gebser, mm -hmm. but did not include the integral structure. Yeah, it, so, was, it was uh, like a late work. I mean, he died, what, 63 or something? And it was like one of the last things he produced, and it was short. Okay, well, the idea was, and maybe you can comment on this, that Ken got off going on Gebser without the integral. <laughs> really, I mean, seriously, and he never, you know, his, so he, he, he gradually shifted gears as he was a transpersonal psychologist and moving towards becoming a philosopher in the 90s. Uh, he gradually shifted gears over to developmental cognitive psychology, yeah. really much, it pretty much is the root of his later work. Uh, so it's all very linear. I, I always think of Gebser as, a, to be mythic, uh, Apollonian, you know, it's a brilliant intellect. But but things are very rational and ordered. I, I love your talk. I, Thank you. As you'll see on my figure of integral thinkers, I actually don't include Wilbur even though he's a good personal friend, because I think it's so rational. Yeah, on, on that same note, I found it really interesting that the two quotes that you picked from the other world, the, the ones where he's painfully self-aware of the limits of reputation. Yes. And then, and, and he strikes me that so much of the time, like, well, okay, if we reify this, it immediately becomes a lot of okay. but. I'm going to go ahead and do that because, I, <laughs> because it seems so important at this point in our in our cultural articulation to do that. And I ran, I came across Gebser uh, through Up for Me, which was kind of like you know basically footnotes to Gebser, really in yeah. that whole book. And and it, that same kind of attitude where he says, well, you know, Gebser says we can't really pinpoint these things, but I'm going to go ahead and do that anyway. <laughs> because when I look at this, uh, this primordial art or this structure or something like that, it definitely seems to be what he's talking about. So, yeah. uh, so we're going to concretize it and can put it in time, which is contrary to the overall, the overarching vision of Gebser, which is you can't do that. And in fact, something really critical is lost when you do it. So. I think that's one reason why uh, Wilbur is so popular. It's, it gives you something you can hold on to, oh, yeah. and, and it's it's kind of it's um, satiating because it's like really, you know, the kind of anxiety with information overload. It makes sense now, it all makes sense and it, it gives you something to grasp, but Gebser is, he slips through your fingers. You know, it's more about the invisibles and the subtleties, which is why I think he's less noted. But, um, Verish and, yeah. Um, in, in Gebser's perspective, um, maybe 
Well, I kind of take a, um, like a, okay, Henry Corbin's view that sort of like the, we are just imaginal beings, like we can't, you know, we're in that mesocosm where all of life is filtered through that, but there's nothing objective past that. There's like, everything is hermeneutical. So that's my own point of view, but in terms of Thompson's work, I think um, that basically was what he was saying, that we have this kind of intuitive, imaginative faculty um, that's underutilized today, and if we tap into that, it's it's not located in linear time, and so it can it can allow us to have a kind of knowledge and way of knowing that is more integral and more a perspectival or a chronon, uh, because it allows us to speak through a space that's free of time and allows things to kind of slip through, which is why I think art is such a great. Um, uh, way to sort of sense what's going to happen, or what's happening presently, and also what happened, and it's all kind of just bound together. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question too well, but Thompson has a great book called uh, The Imaginary Landscape, and this basically, he unpacks myth and imagination and fairy tale, and sort of analogizes it with evolution and the sciences and stuff, and there's really interesting correlations uh, between all that, so. No, he doesn't, which is funny. Well, oddly enough, Gemta was the only painter around us with the old Corban was there. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I haven't found any evidence of they interacted or, I mean, I no. would have been, you know, I would no. love to have known the interaction they might have had. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, to get to Thompson, I guess, I was really interested in. This, the way that you talked about the postmodern notion that from network knowledge, that there is nothing original, and you said that art is kicked on pastiche, collage, etc. And uh, when I was thinking, when you talked about that, I was thinking about the, the YN. I mean, can you go to the A little bit. So that sort of YN notion of the perfect drama and penetration, etc. is this sort of. Um, transparent matrix in which um, things can move through each other while retaining their distinction, mm -hmm. paradoxically, which is what we're talking about. But that, so paradoxically, when you talk about nothing being original, really what you're speaking of is that everything is of origin. And that actually, in placing oneself in this place where the ego just no longer has the narcissistic supply, of assuming that it is creating something that from whole cloth, mm -hmm. but assuming that you are embedded in this matrix of continual transformation, novelty, and creativity, you are everything is original. Mm -hmm. So I love yeah. that, that the way that, that nothing is original, everything is original, is a completely, and again, this is in a perspective. You know, so you're moving away from perspective, and I love that you did that because perspective just keeps you bound to an ecological emplacement. But here, we're in origin, and we are all original mm -hmm. and creative. I love that. Yeah, I love that too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, is there time for one more? Uh, yeah. uh, Jeremy, just one note. It, it doesn't come up too often in Cape Street, but it, um, Alfred North Whitehead and organicism and process philosophy, but even also the, the notion of novelty in Whitehead, so that uh, I mean, sometimes we say, well, nothing is original, and we can go to France, and we can travel with Derrida and all, everybody else and say nothing is original, which in some ways may, may devolve to uh, the ego can exhaust itself. But uh, in Whitehead's organicism, every actual occasion of the process of reality has a factor of novelty. So that every breath we take, every electronic interaction has an element of novelty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like That's saying the same thing. Kind yeah. of, I yeah. think. Yeah. Or a similar thing. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.